Assalamu alaikum. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. What about here? Assalamu alaikum? Okay, good. Uh, first of all, I'll finish off the story with the story of the story of the story of the story of the اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا أعود نفسي بكلمات الله التامة وكم الشيطان وهامة وكم العين النامة Whenever I start any, uh, you know, khutbah, any speech I'd like to have the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing that I'm doing it for the right reasons and knowing that I'm doing it for the right intentions um, First of all, I'd like to I, I also like to thank everybody here for coming uh, without people like you, you know, they wouldn't be missed at all. And when I was growing up in high school, I wish I had something like missed. I really wish I had something like missed. Like even yesterday, refereeing for a basketball tournament, it was amazing. Like the turnout and Muslim brothers coming together, it was, it was a really amazing experience. And I wish I had that growing up in, uh, in high school because I really struggled in high school to um, not necessarily um, with the temptations, but I was, I, I didn't have a lot of, I, I didn't have my uh, support in terms of friends, like there weren't a lot of Muslims in Central, there were a lot of Muslims, but you know, they, uh, they were doing their own thing, <laughs> and I was just trying to get into college, um, and they were immature too, so, um, so to begin my presentation, <coughs> I didn't choose the, the topic or the, uh, somebody else chose it, so when struggle appeared, I persevered. So the objectives during this uh, speech is, what is patience? And I'm going to go through what is my story and how I was able to, you know, keep going with, you know, despite everything that I went through. Um, and also the Quranic ayat that kept me going. How to have patience with your parents. We all know that, you know, that's a struggle as well. Uh, and then patience within yourself and then patience with others. And inshallah, you know, we'll have an overall lesson. That we live in a fast-paced world. Every, everything is really very fast, very uh, technological. You want to send, send an email to somebody, then then boom, it's there. Uh, you want to cook, cook your food, it's in the microwave. Thirty seconds, bam, it's done. That's it. So we've we've in this world we kind of um, have seen that it's very fast-paced. Being slow is not normal for us. It's not it's not something normal. Uh, we always want to do something fast. We always want to, you know, finish finish on time in terms of your graduation date. Finish or not fail any classes. You, whenever it's like patience has been a word of shame. It's like it hasn't been in our daily life. So that's why you know we're always busy with you know our technology and and everything that we don't really take the time to you know say uh, thanks to all the Taala. You know he's he's moving you through these whole through this fast-paced world, you know, and you're going. But who's who's moving you? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is moving you. And do you take the time to pray your prayers on time? Do you go to Salat the Fajr? I know that's hard. Do you um, are you anikbir? You have obedience to your parents. And you know that's my point here. It's like patience now has been a word of shame. It's it's not practical. Patience is not practical nowadays. Now there are three types of patience. Patience in abstaining from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says the halal or haram in our in the Quran. And um, he's also told us what to stay away from, what we can do, what we can't do. And ma'asi, the the things that are bad. Um, usually you know in the message that I that I go to um, People really don't come to the masjid unless it's Ramadan. Ramadan is that one special month that everybody goes to the masjid. You come five days after Ramadan, a week after Ramadan, ain't nobody there. So, you know, is that is that the type of people that we are? We don't we don't I'm not a big masjid, we don't say salam to the masjid, you know, to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except for Ramadan. Oh, because it's Ramadan, I can't do this. I'm gonna do I'm gonna stop doing it for a month. They on Eid, oh it's here, that's it, I'm going to start doing it again, you know, I'm okay now, you know, in terms of maybe the sisters, I wear hijab all over Ramadan, and then it doesn't carry over, and it's like, okay, uh, it's Eid, time to take it off, you know, so, you know, these are things that we struggle with, um, 
patience and persevering, persevering and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your life will become easier. And here, what I mean by persevering and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what has He written for you to do in terms of the five prayers? Are you praying your five prayers? Is it hard for you to go to Salat al Fajr? Salat al Fajr is a hard thing for me to do. And it's really hard, you know, just to wake up in the middle of the night and pray your prayers. Um, patience during calamities and disasters. So when a musibah or a calamity hits you, what are you like? What kind of person are you like? Do you freak out? Do you stay steadfast? Or do you, you know, you're just out of control? You're just, you're basically, you're doing kufr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what I mean by that is you're questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why me? Why, why me? You know, why do I have to go through this? What's the point of this? You know, for this thing to happen to me. You know, so these are all these questions that uh, patience uh, is important. So what do you get when you're a patient? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are patient, you have three ways of connecting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the law, you have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. You're the habib of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else do you want more than that? The guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, when it was um, hold on a second. Wallahu ma So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you, is guiding you when you're patient. And then, um, uh, so there's, these are three Quranic ayat that talk about your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're being patient. So the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the habib of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you're basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ghimmat Allah. You're in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, Allah, you know, work. Allah has put you on the right path if you become patient. Glad tidings. Glad tidings. That means, who, what more do you want? Glad tidings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything you see, it will be easy. Now, in Surah Al-Zumar, it says, إِنَّمَا يُوَفُّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ and this means the patient will be given their reward without account. But what do I mean by that? This has two meanings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you are patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then He grants you paradise without any, judg without any judgment. You're, you don't get any sunlight on that day. People are waiting thousands of years in the sunlight. And you, you just go straight to Jannah. Imagine that. Huh? If you're patient with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you in the dunya, and you're sabr or turba, turba ala qada illa. What does that mean? You are satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what He does to you and what He puts you through. Uh, uh, in Surah Al Baqarah, it's لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't put you through something unless He knows He can handle it. That's all there is to it. He won't put you something that is overwhelming. He knows you can handle it. He created you and He knows you. And I want to go back to a point where. Patience, why is it important? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the dunya in, in six days maybe. But isn't he the same person that says, Insha'a yakun fa yakun? That means if he wills it, then it will happen. Yeah, so that means he could have created the days or, or the dunya and the earth in, in just like that. But he didn't. He wants to show us that everything requires uh, time and patience. <coughs> Uh, so why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strike us with calamities? Uh, number one, to wipe our sins. Um, when you have a fever, even when you have a fever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is uh, forgiving you for every minute that you have that fever. Or say for instance, you haven't been doing so great religiously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, come back to me. He won't he put you through a calamity, and He'll see the way you react. He'll put you through a calamity, and He'll see the way you react, and it's just a way for Him to tell you, come back to me. You've been doing something wrong, you, you, you've been deviating away from the path, come back to me. Um, to raise our degrees in heaven. Like I said, in Ma'ruf al-Sabir, on Ajrah and Bilayr al-Hisab. They go into Jannah, that's it. They don't, they don't, they don't wait in line, they don't, um, they don't, they're, they're shielded by uh, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on a day where there is no shield, or there is no protection, so if you become patient in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you in the afterworld. Um, so to differentiate between people based on their actions, 
like I said, we, so, we are struck, so we are not struck with arrogance if our life is so happy and easy. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, you know, put you on a path where everything is going great. Everything is going wonderful. He'll, he'll, he'll give you everything. He'll give you everything, but then he'll, he'll wait for you. He'll wait, when are you going to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When did you thank me? When did you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When was the last time you thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the things that he's given you? Uh, to give us a chance to go back to Allah, like I said. Uh, to help us earn more towards paradise where there is no calamities. Uh, there's a hadith uh, where a poor man, um, where he suffered nothing but calamities in his, in his life. And they brought him and dipped him in, in Jannah. And then they asked him, did you suffer, did you see anything bad in the dunya? Did you suffer in the dunya? And wallahi, I haven't suffered any, at all. I haven't suffered at all. Nothing. I'm okay. I, this was nothing for me. Just one dip in Jannah did that to him. And then uh, there was a man, another man who basically had, a, had it really tough and everything, or had it his way the whole dunya, in his whole dunya. And then he was dipped in Jahannam, one dip in Jahannam. And he was like, um, and they, they asked him, how was, how was the dunya for you? Oh, it was full of ma'asi, it was full of, it was full of uh, uh, calamities, it was, I had nothing in the, in, in the dunya. But then when he, he was dipped in Jahannam, he really saw the reality of what Jahannam is. Um, and to remind us that, to thank Allah for the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to show us his mercy after a calamity. Um, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. I'm not supposed to show that yet. Um, first and foremost, I want to tell you guys that I'm going to share my story with you guys. And it's very personal. It's very, very personal for me. This is the second time I've ever talked about it in public. A lot of people know about it, but I haven't talked about it in, in person. This is the second time I've talked about it. And at the end of this, I, I might you know, put 10 minutes, 5 minutes. I want you guys to open up. These are all your Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, open up. Maybe share a story. Maybe share a calamity that has hit you recently. You don't know what to do. We're all brothers and sisters here. Okay? So we're all here for together. And maybe we can share your story after I'm done mine. So, and if you don't share your story, I'm picking somebody. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, June 17, 1998, I was born. Um, I was born uh, a month early. And uh, I was born very light. And I, as you can see, there is oxygen in my nose at that point. So I was very lightweight. I was very uh, fragile at that point. And as you can see, my parents' uh, smiles, they're smiling. They're, they're, they're very joyous. But soon enough, they'll find out something that will turn their smiles into frowns, into, into depression. But I mean, so I'll get into that. When I was born, I was, uh, I was born with nephrotic syndrome. What does that mean? That means both my kid, uh, kidneys uh, failed when I was younger. Um, and what did they do? Um, basically, the doctor came up to my parents and told them that your son is not going to live past the age of three. He has too many complications. His kidneys has failed. And I don't see him living past the age of three. So, you know, my parents were devastated. And you can imagine how a parent can feel when, you know, calamity strikes them with their son. Um, so. The doc, one of the doctors, uh, they felt sorry for my, for my parents, and they came up to my parents and told them, uh, feed him a lot of eggs. Feed him a lot of eggs. That's protein. And just to nourish my immune system. Um, so that's all my mom did. She put pancake, uh, in my pancakes she put eggs. In my chocolate chip cookies she put eggs. Everything you can imagine she put eggs in it. Just so I, just so I could nourish. Um, uh, do you like eggs anymore? I love eggs. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it's great. Um, in my childhood, as you can see right now, in this stage, I was, you know, I looked normal. I looked like a normal kid. Uh, and I lived with my kidneys. Because of my mom, I lived with my kid both my kidneys until the age of five. At the age of five, my kidneys both failed. Uh, at that point, the doctor said they have to remove the kidneys. They weren't supposed to remove the kidneys. They were supposed to put me straight on dialysis and uh, to clean my body and whatever. And um, they, didn't, they didn't do that. They probably used my kidneys for some type of research or something. Because my parents, they were, they were new to the country and they uh, didn't know any better. They thought the doctor was, 
was the, you know, the expert. And things got worse. So from the age of five to the age of eight, I was on dialysis. I was on perineal dialysis. That means um, my, both of my kidneys uh, did not work. And um, I was put on a machine where it filtered the blood out of my body. It filtered the fluid and the, whatever a kidney does, dialysis does. It doesn't do most of what a kidney does. It does one fourth of what a kidney does. But it allows you to live. So for that, I think a little bit that. Um, so you know, you can see the, the physical features of myself where it's drastically changed. You know, from from this to this. Uh, you know, the one where I'm in a hospital gown. Come on. Uh, so it was very, it was very uh, an emotional time for my parents. Even my little brother was born, and um, he didn't get as much attention because of me. My my mom was always worried about me, and she used to let him have whatever he wanted because she was always worried about me and taking care of me. So things got worse. I was on dialysis for three years, um, and March 31st, 1998, I got a transplanted kidney. Uh, from a donor, uh, from somebody who got in a car accident. So they called. They called my house. I remember like it was yesterday. Uh, I was in, I was sitting in class, and um, the teacher was like, "Amad, uh, come here." I was like, and and I was like, "Okay, what's up?" And she said, "Go to the principal's office." And I'm like, "Damn," you know. I'm like, and I'm and then as I'm walking past the hallway, you know, I'm thinking to myself, "What did I do that day?" Like. Did I push somebody during recess? Did I do something bad to somebody during recess? Is this why I'm going to the principal's office? So I go to the principal's office, and they tell me that your parents want to talk to you. And my mom talks to me, and she was overwhelmed with joy. And she told me, you got a kidney. Come to um, the house right now. We're going to go to the hospital, and they got a new kidney for you. So I was overwhelmed with joy, and it was a great day that day. Um, and all of a blessed me with, the ki with, with this kidney for 12 years. 12 years of a quote unquote normal life. Um, despite the fact that I wasn't on dialysis and I wasn't hooked to a machine, that was, I wasn't a slave to a machine anymore, I was still uh, on, while having a kidney, yeah, sure, you get a kidney, but the body is going to reject something that isn't his or isn't mine. So I have to take a lot of medications for it, uh, numerous medications for it, um, to prevent the kidney from failing. And to, and to keep the kidney healthy. So, and a lot of these medications, they have, um, uh, they have side effects. And the side effects include, like, I, I don't know if you saw this picture, but yellow teeth. The iron caused the yellow teeth. Over hair, you know, a lot of hair growth. Um, you know, and physical features, it just makes you really, it shapes your features. Um, so, I mean, I lived 12 years of a normal life, and for me, it really, I wasn't really living a normal life like everybody else. I, uh, during high school, I was always, um, I was allowed extra time for uh, assignments, I was allowed extra time for exams, uh, and some people, they didn't, they didn't want to give me the, the extra time. They felt like my disability wasn't a disability. They felt like it wasn't, it wasn't appropriate for me to get extra time, it wasn't appropriate, it wasn't fair. So at times my, my parents would have to come in and really explain to them, you know, what the hell are you doing, you know? Like, this, this kid is on a uh, kidney transplant and he's, you know, still studying in high school and he's still going through high school and his education. That's the one thing I, I really thank my, my uh, dad for. He, even at an earlier stage when I was going through dialysis, he said, put him through school. You know, busy him with something. Don't make him disabled in the house on this machine, allow him to do his education, fulfill his education. And now that's been my number one motivator for me. So you know, as you can see, I graduated high school, alhamdulillah. <coughs> you know, I've seen a lot of people, you know, Siraj Wahaj, I've hang around a lot of people. Um, on November 2010, my kidney failed again. The kidney that I had, that was transplanted for 12 years, it failed again, once again. Uh, it was due to progressive failure. Sometimes even the medications, they cause this, uh, this rejection of the kidney. And um, I gotta tell you, um, it's, some, it's somewhat my fault too, 
because during high school I was very secluded. I, my parents were, were raising me very secluded. They just wanted me to pass, get through high school, go to USP, and get an education. Make something out of yourself. Don't become a disabled person. So I was focused on really getting through high school and going to USP. However, because of this, I didn't have much of a social life. I didn't have an MSA back, back when I was in high school. It wasn't created until my last year of high school, and we still had problems creating it in my last year of high school. And therefore, I just focused on my education. And what I'm trying to get at is I didn't have a lot of freedom during the kidney process. I, my food was limited. Um, I, used to, I, I couldn't eat anything but, non, but you know, a low-sodium diet. So stuff with not a lot of sodium. I couldn't eat out with friends. I couldn't um, eat some things that people were going out to. It was, it was really hard for me to go through high school and not have that social interaction. So when college came, I felt a sense of freedom. I felt a sense that, you know, I'm in, I'm in college now, you know. Nothing is going to happen to me if, if I, you know, eat this pizza or if I eat some noodles, you know. Those instant noodles, those are really bad for you. <laughs> Just saying. Um, they really, they were really the cause of my deterioration of my kidney, um, and it was somewhat my fault because, you know, I ate them and I indulged myself, and it was my fault that my kidney failed again, and now I'm on dialysis again. Um, November 2010, I was in my third year uh, of college, and it was a month before finals, um, and I was getting, I got the news that yeah, your kidneys are failed and you have to be on dialysis soon. If you don't want to go on dialysis, you need to get a kidney donor. So, it was two months before finals, three months. And I was, I was very active in trying to get a kidney donor. So I wouldn't be able to get on dialysis again. Although I didn't remember what dialysis was. In my mind, it was just, okay, I'm just going to go to a dialysis center, get my blood clean for, for four hours, and that's it. Hello, Siani. It's no big deal. Um, and basically, that's, that wasn't... That wasn't how it went. Um, basically, the, I tried to campaign for my to try to get a kidney donor, and things didn't work out, and I got on dialysis again. They put a catheter in my chest that connected to the heart, and then you know through through the heart, through the tubes, they basically connect the tubes to the machine, and it goes through <coughs> and it goes through this uh, machine and it cleans the blood. As well as cleaning the blood, it also uh, takes away the fluid that you drank from your last dialysis treatment. Right now, I can't drink that much. I, can't, I mean, I can drink, but I have to watch my, my drinking because, um, because then if I drink too much, my heart will, uh, I'll have a heart attack, basically. Um, and so there's a lot of limiting factors while I'm on dialysis. And um, while I was on dialysis, I took a fall to the head. Um, basically, I was after a treatment, and keep in mind, dialysis is very excruciating on the body. It's very draining on the body. Right now, I came from dialysis in the morning, and I was exhausted. I, I think I have a fever right now, <laughs> but, you know, I just wanted to come here and, you know, really send my message to you guys, and hopefully you guys can learn something from it, and, you know, continue to be patient. So I took a fall to the head because um, I uh, got off the machine, I went to the main lobby, I grabbed a tissue or a towel, and I fainted. I fainted and I fell back on my head. Now, the back of your head is the occipital lobe, and that's where your vision is. And there was a lot of blood when I fell on my head. Um, and an emergency came, and they took me, and they took me to the hospital. I was lucky. I didn't lose my vision. I didn't, you know. Uh, Na'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a lot of na'am, a lot of blessings that you have to be really thankful for. You know, you think you really got it bad? You think I got it bad? No, I don't got it bad. I tell you who has it bad. People who I work with. As an occupational therapist, I work with patients who are physically and mentally uh, disabled. People with CP, people, you know, like adults with uh, mental disabilities such as schizophrenia, uh, dementia physical disabilities such as spinal cord injuries and um, you know physical disabilities, CDAs like strokes. When you get a stroke you can't, you can't use half your body. 
I've seen and I've treated people like that. People don't want to come to therapy, believe me. I tried. So I, I'll tell you, I'll share this story with you guys. I had a client who had a stroke, a left-sided stroke. That means it affected his right side. His whole right side is weak. His whole, 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 whole right side is weak. He can move it at that much though. He needed maximal assistance with toileting, with dressing, upper body dressing, lower body dressing, everything. And he was telling me, I, don't, I feel hopeless. I feel very ashamed to be here. I feel like a burden to my family. And one thing I shared with him was my story. And alhamdulillah, he was able to uh, come back to doing therapy, and he got a lot better. I have another story of a guy who had dementia. Dementia is a mental disability where it affects your brain. And it basically, you're very delusional. You're very delusional. You're, very, you're not there, basically. And he needed help using the toilet. Help you in the toilet. You can go to the toilet, can't you? You can wash yourself, can't you? This guy needed help, needed my help to clean him. And yeah, as an occupational therapist, I do that. And basically, I you know helped him get on the toilet, literally transfer him on the toilet, helped him clean himself, and got him back on the chair. As when he got back on the chair, he was like, um, he started crying, and I was like, why are you crying? He's like, because I used to do this myself, and now I have somebody else doing it for me. Although he had dementia, he's still, he's still there. He's still there. He knows, he knows what he's going through. So I, 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 I really helped him out with uh, his disability. I really helped him out with his dementia. Be thankful for the blessings that you have. You can walk. You can talk. You have your arms. You can hear. Samak. Samak. Wabasak. You can hear. You can see. Be thankful for what you have. Um, so back to the story. Despite all of this, alhamdulillah. And, you know, we think, وَيْنْ تَعْدُوا نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُونَ In the Quran it says, I'll, I'll go on later to explain it, but it says, um, and if you're able to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're countless. So, really appreciate what you have. Um, and work at it. I met a lot of people. I met Amr Khalid, I met um, Tariq Ramadan, I met Zayd Shakir, I met um, Baba Ali, I met Habib Jeffrey, I met a lot of people to try to spread my word, to try to, try to spread my message, to try to get a kidney. Um, you know, and it still hasn't worked, but you have to, you have to fight through it. You really have to fight through it. Um, last time I talked at, at Temple's event, I was talking about it. I was talking about, you know, my life story and everything, but then I got emotional. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you, you know, puts you through life and you're living your life. You know, it's all fast paced and it's all, you know, you're going through your life uh, steadfast and everything's fast. You're going through college, you're trying to go through high school, you, you know, you're trying to get your diploma. But then I talked about it and I got emotional because you really don't realize how much I, how much I have to thank for. I have to be thankful for, you know. I got emotional because, you know, people have it a lot worse than you do. People have it a lot worse than I do. And, you know, this is fulfilling my destiny. Uh, you know, I worked at a Temple University Hospital at one point. I, uh, I graduated with my bachelor's in health science. And trust me, it wasn't easy. It was not easy at all. But what got me through it was my motivation to become a better person, my motivation to get that degree and make something out of myself. And these are more pictures over the years. Obviously, I'm not really happy for graduating, right? Surah uh, Al-Baqarah, um, it says, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحَبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ um, But perhaps you hate a thing <coughs> and it's good for you. And perhaps you love a thing and it's bad for you. I wasn't the most patient person in the world, no. I, you know, I stayed at home for a week after my... Um, after my kidney failed, I stayed at home for a week and I was just depressed. I was in bed, I was not doing anything. I was um, really out of it. I was questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, it's not what you're supposed to do though. You're not supposed to question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was one thing that my mom always told me. You're, you're a hero to everybody, she would tell me. You're a hero to everybody and you motivate people. You inspire others, other people. And she told me, you can do this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got you through 20 years of life. 
when my kidney failed, I was 20. I was 20. I was proud that I got you through 20 years of life. He can't get you through this. So that's exactly what I kept in mind. <clears throat> and, you know, you might hate a thing. Yeah, I hated the fact that I was on dialysis again. But maybe it was good for me. Maybe I needed to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala myself. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching me a lesson to go back to him and to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, uh, you know, maybe you love a thing, but maybe it's, it's bad for you. Maybe a job interview or something that you think it's great in your head, and then it doesn't happen. And you're like, oh, damn, you know, why didn't this happen? Oh, Allah, why, 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 why? Maybe it's good for you. It took a lot. Uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, like I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't put you through anything unless he knows you can handle it. Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ In Surah Al-Mulk he says, uh, He who created death and life to test you. So literally, we are put in this dunya for tribulations, for tests. And we live... How many days? How many, how many years? We don't live that, that long. The afterlife is longer than the dunya. You have to keep that in mind. Because our days are limited. You live for the moment, and you continue and you move forward. And here, basically, he's telling you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, to test you. He will put you through tribulations. And he knows how you're going to react. And yeah, even if you're not patient, over here in the next ayah, or, and he follows it with, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ what does that mean? And he is almighty and forgiving. Don't worry, if you're not patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. If you're not patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. The doors of forgiveness are always open. Surah Ibrahim. And if you should count the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot emerate them, you couldn't count them. Um, Indeed, mankind is most unjust and ungrateful. When was the last time you thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has given you? When was the last time you thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being in America? When was the last time you thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you good parents, for, you know, having arms, for having feet, for being able to talk, being able to walk, being able to, um, you know, enjoy in the society, being able to be in an educational system that's good. Being able to be here and missed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, does all this for a reason. In the Surah Al-Duha it says, مَا وَدَّعْكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَدَى Your Lord has nor forsaken you, nor does He abhor you. That means don't worry, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not uh, let you down, He hasn't. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرُ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُدَى The Akhirah or the afterlife is better for you than this dunya. The dunya is very short. Um, this stuck to me very well. It means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you as much as you need, as much as you are satisfied with. Don't ever say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give me this nice car, or didn't give me this Gucci bag, or didn't give me this, um, this or that, or you know, I, I wish I had his intelligence, or you know, something like that. لَا تَكْفُرَ بِاللَّهِ سُبْحَانَ تَعَالَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for a reason. إِنَّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala خَلَقَكَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِينَ He created you with the best man, with the best character, with the best physical shape. He knows you. He knows you best. So, I'm going to go on with patience with your parents. I know this is something that um, in the past I've struggled with and probably every single one of you because you're in high school you probably struggle with it too. Oh, mom, why can't I go up, you know, tonight? Or why can't I do this? Why can't I get this? Uh, you know, why can't I do this? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقَضَى رُبُّكَ أَن لَا تَعْبَدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّا عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرْ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا What does this mean? And your Lord has decreed you that you not worship except for Him, and to your parents do good treatment. Whether one of, one of or both of them have reached old age, say not a word like, oh, you cannot say, oh, 
What do you guys do when you, when you scream at your parents? You're screaming. I'm saying, oh, the Quran says, oh, you can't even say, oh. And you're screaming at your parents, you know, telling them you want to go out or you're so unfair. I hate you, you know. Don't do that. What does that mean? <coughs> Respect yourself. Respect yourself and be good to your parents. When was the last time, as a high school student, you sat down with your parents and ate dinner with them? When was the last time? I want, I want to show of hands. When was the last time you sat down with your parents and had dinner with them? Okay. When was the last time you spoke with them on the phone? You can, you can call it out. When was the last time you, you talked to them on the phone? Okay. So that's the point here. That's the point here. But for the high school students, you see your parents every day. As college students, sometimes we don't get to see our parents. We're, we're in different campuses, we're in far dis distances, and then you see your parents calling you. And then when you see the parents calling, ah, get out of here. Hello, I'm not, I'm not going to answer them. Hello, you know? Why do I need to call them? I, I'm free. I'm in college, you know? Or I'm, I'm by myself working, or I'm doing this. No. Respect yourself. Respect your parents. Don't say oof to them. And second, so in this ayah you can see that the second most important thing to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's so important that he mentioned it after worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be good to your parents. That means you know it's important. My, my, uh, my parents and I, we have a great relationship. Um, you know, I eat with them. I sit with them. I call them. They're annoying, let me tell you. They are very annoying to me sometimes. And, you know, but... It's called sabr. It's called patience. Be patient with them. Ahtaram. You know? Uh, and communication. Don't ever respond when you're angry. In the last, uh, in the last lecture, Qaysar said something. Don't react quickly. If you're angry, go to a different place. Or move your spot. Move your orientation. Make wudu. Relax yourself. Ibtism. Smile. I know it's hard to do while you're angry, you know? Um, but don't respond when you're angry. Because you know when you respond when you're angry, you're going to hurt their feelings. You're going to hurt your parents' feelings. You have to understand that, yeah, I'm only a college kid. I'm only 22 years old. But you really see the, perspe the perspective of parents. Your parents are only there for you, honestly. They want to see you nourish. They want to see you grow. They want to see what's best for you. So when they tell you these things, when they tell you you can't do this, you can't do that, it's not because they don't love you. It's because, you know, they're just looking out for you. Uh, so you're able to get your point across when you're calm. Kun harim, kun calm. Patience with yourself. I see this as a most important point. Because once you become patient within yourself, um, you're, you'll see the next slide, you're able to become patient with others. Right? So, patience within yourself. Take the hate, the karahiya, take the jealousy, take the negativity out of your heart. See everybody for who they are. Yeah, this girl, you know, she does this, or she wears a hijab like this, or, you know, she talks to boys, oh my God. And, you know, I know, that's all gossip and everything. But, really, somebody's pointing to somebody else. She just called him out. In ahsantum, ahsantum ni anfusikum. If you better yourself, you, you, if you better yourself, if you become a better person, it's only for the benefit of yourself. Not for the benefit of anybody else in the room. It's only for you. You're coming here. Why? You want to benefit yourself. You want to see Muslim brothers and sisters gathering here. I wish I had something like this in this during during high school. I didn't. I didn't. You know, I wish I had competitions and everything. I didn't. I didn't have a backbone. So protect protect your Muslim brothers and sisters. Really protect them. So when you take the hate and cut off here and you take it out of your heart, you learn to love everybody. That's what I do. Personally, that's what I do. I don't I don't judge people. Yeah, you might think, yeah, okay, you judge people, bro. No. It's, and it's hard. It's, it's something that's very hard to do. And, and, and it, upsets, it upsets me when I see somebody doing something wrong or, or, you know, somebody going the wrong way, you know. You can only take what's good and leave what's bad, which brings me to my next slide. Once you're patient within yourself, you're patient with other people. Everybody has flaws. Let's, let's, not, let's not forget that. Everybody has flaws. 
and you take what's good and you leave what's bad. So don't get angry or upset. Have characteristics of forgiveness. Kun yani mutasalam. Be be humble with people. And that way you become patient. Uh, Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, what happened to him? He had brothers that were jealous of him and they basically um, were jealous of his relationship with his with their father and they took they took him away. They put him in a well in a desert. He was sold to somebody else. He was then in prison. He was then, you know, a slave to one of the kings. And then he was also, you know, jailed after the fact that Imrat al Aziz, the queen of Egypt, wanted to have, have for, do fornication with him. But remember, he was the most beautiful prophet. He was the most beautiful prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what happened in the end? He became the wazir. He became like the trust fund of Egypt. Almost like a big guy, really a big guy in Egypt. And then he forgave his, his brothers. Can you do something like that? Can you be like Prophet Yusuf? Forgive your brothers after 12 years of what they put, what, what they put you through? No. Be like our prophets. Prophet Yusuf, Prophet Muhammad. Now, I like this point because um, it just tells you to be positive in life and to have a positive outlook in life. Estafa uh, versus Ijtaba. Estafa means to choose just because. You like a blue shirt, you're gonna get it. you're gonna get it, it's Gucci, you like it because it's Gucci, you buy it. Okay? That's that's estafa. Ijtaba, what does that mean? You you choose for a reason. Like an interview. You go for an interview and you get asked a couple questions, you have to dress professionally, you have to be on top of your game on top of your game, you have to be confident. And that's that's ijtaba. I choose you because you have these characteristics. In the Quran, what does it say? وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Who ijtabakum? Allah. How beautiful is that? That means He chose you. He chose you. He knows that He chose you to be Muslim for a reason. He's chosen you to represent Islam for a reason. You know, you're not just anybody. You're, just, you're not just anybody. He didn't pick you just because. Okay? He picked you because there's something special about you. There's something special about each and every single one of us. Show people the best of what you have, you know. Uh, in Surah Yasin, uh, it says, "Inna nahnu nuhi al-mauta wa naktabu ma qaddamu wa atharahum wa kulli shayin ahsaynahu fi imam mubin." So, what does this mean? It means, indeed, it is we who bring the dead to life and record what they put forth in the dunya and what they have left behind. Don't be, don't be like a, a cloud that just, you know, went by and didn't even rain, you know. Don't, don't be a, a, you know, a person where, let me, let, me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. And, you know, uh, imagine it's your funeral. I'm not here to jinx you, by the way. Imagine it's my, it's, imagine it's my funeral, okay? All right? And, you know, you have four people in back of you. And you're you're on top. You're in the coffin. You can still hear them. You can hear them, but you can't argue with them. And they and they say, what did they say? Allah yirhamu ma'amal shihada zayyima ge zayyima mishi. What does that mean? It means you know Allah yirhamu may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, but he entered this world and left it the way he was. He didn't do anything. Don't be don't be like that person. Some people they have their uh, their stars, you know, a imprint. You know, in Hollywood, they have imprints. You know, leave an imprint. Leave, leave something behind so that people can remember, remember you by. Um, so, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, strange is the affair of a mu'min. Rarely all his affairs are good. If something pleasing befalls him, he is thankful. And it becomes better for him. And if something harmful um, befalls him, he is patient. And it becomes better for him. And this is only for the moment. So somebody who is actually patient in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for you. Asbur. I know, I know, I know I'm just saying Asbur. And it's like, okay, what do you mean Asbur? I have an example. I have another example for you. See these two bottles? One is full. One is empty, right? Can you tell me the difference between... How, how does... How, how can you make a connection between a full bottle and an empty bottle? So somebody, you want to answer? 
Okay, so one has patience and one doesn't have patience. So when the calamity hits him, that's it. He's, he's, not, he's not able to be patient with it. And how about this one? I'm barely moving it. It's the same pressure, it's the same calamity, but you're able to be patient. You're able to say, Alhamdulillah, kulli hayat. In Asabahum Sharm, Qalu inna lillahi wa inna lihi rajiun. To him we belong and to him we will go. You know? So that's the difference between this is something practical for you. Next time you want to be patient, remember this. You're gonna are you gonna freak out? You're gonna freak out and not be patient? Or are you gonna be strong and be positive and be yourself? So how to improve your patience? Know that this life, I have said it before, qasira, it's very qasira, it's very short. Uh, knowing that you do belong to Allah and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will go. Uh, dunya qasira, and the happiness is not here. The sa'ad al-kamila huwa the jannah. The full happiness is in jannah. Knowing that the rewards of heaven and the happy and the happiness is in jannah. Be sure that Allah will lift the calamity, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, with harsh, with harsh, <coughs> comes ease. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Fa inna ma'al usri yusra. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran. Verily, with every difficulty comes relief. No, no, no. Listen, listen. With every calamity comes relief. He's telling you twice. He repeated it twice. Yeah, you might be going through something right now. Sure. But know that the future is something positive. There is relief. Be patient. Uh, the takeaway message that I have is represent Islam well uh, with your success, with your manners, with your character, with your interpersonal connections, with your interpersonal dealings. Be a good citizen. Be a good American citizen. You're able to, you're able to say that I am proud to be Muslim and I'm also proud to be an American. You're able to say, and an Islam. There was this one uh, speaker, his name is Amr Khalid. He, there was something that he said that was very effective in my life. He said, in order for you to pay, be patient in life, you have to tell yourself, "Ana Islam, I'm Islam, wa ahsan tamtil al-Islam, wa lo to wahdi." And the best representative of Islam, even if I'm by myself, "Ana Islam, I am Islam. I'm, I'm going to walk in the streets, and I'll stay Islam. I'm going to communicate with Americans, and I'm going to stay Islam." And in Islam, even if the dunya is in, is in chaos, I, I, I understand that I am a Muslim and my Prophet has taught me to be successful with my interpersonal connections and your manners. Know this, into the Islam. You're the example. Especially you high school students. What is the ma'andak? Show the best of what you have. You know what I mean? Be the top of your class. I know it's hard, but be the top of your class. Show the, show the, Muslim, show the Americans around the world that you are a Muslim, and you're an American as well, but your religion doesn't stand for violence. It stands for peace. It stands for success. And uh, don't leave this world, like I said, without leaving a legacy. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to become an occupational therapist because I want to help other people. I know I don't have it well. <coughs> It's been two years on dialysis right now. It's been two years. The other day, my mom said she was like, you know, it, it, the time is really quick. You know, you you went through dialysis for two years now. Isn't it really quick? I was like, no, mama. I didn't. I didn't go through dialysis quick. I felt every freaking treatment that I went to. I felt it. Every freaking treatment that I have that I have gone to in these past two years. So my my goal in life is to be successful and to leave something behind me and to leave a message behind me and to give inspiration to young youth that you can do it despite the temptations and despite what people tell you be yourself don't lose your identity into Muslim, don't lose your identity be a Muslim, but don't lose your identity I, I'm telling you to interact with the Americans but don't lose your identity you know, don't, don't go to the temptations and your whims um, and also protect your brotherhood and sisterhood. I didn't have a brotherhood and sisterhood when I was uh, in high school, but you guys do. Look, look at this crowd. Everybody's together. All the Muslims gathered here for mist. You know, it's something to be proud of. Protect yourself, and 
yeah, sure, you're going to argue, and sure, you're going to disagree with, with each other, but disagree um, Be compassionate when you disagree with the other people, with hub, with love. Don't, don't disagree people and put them down. You know, yeah, you know, that's how friendships are. There's going to be bumps in the road. But be compassionate to one another. Help one another. Don't let somebody go on astray. Don't let one of your sisters or one of your brothers to go astray. And that's the point of having a good brotherhood and sisterhood. And that's my end of my PowerPoint presentation. I hope you, inshallah, learned something from this. And my message did reach you. And um, be patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the best for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to put you through something unless he knows you can handle it. I know it's hard. Patience is a hard virtue to, uh, you know, to have. And, you know, myself included, you know. But be patient and be adverse and when calamity hits you. And that's the difference between a non-patient per person and a patient person. That's the difference. He, he goes and, and he, he loses himself. When, when calamity hit, hits him, he finds more in depth. Oh, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? You can't put this back. You can't put this back to where it was. No. Because you didn't have patience. Class. Be strong. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much.